pleasure to welcome you to the second of two events about the challenges of digital transformation, formally launching the Center for Digital Governance at the Hertie School. My name is Gerd Hammerschmidt, and I'm the director of the Center for Digital Governance and professor of public management at the Hertie School. And I have to apologize our acting president, Mark Hallerberg, who unfortunately cannot join us um, today um, due to very, very urgent um, things which came up last minute. He, however, asked me to send you his best apologies, uh, his apologies and best wishes. Let me start with a few words about our still rather young and, and new Center for Digital Governance and how it fits within the Hertie School structure. The Hertie School under its president, Henrik Enderlein, has created five um, centers of competence focusing on key global, uh, key global policy and governance challenges with the aim to strengthen the school's competence and outreach and, and visibility in these areas. And digital, digital governance clearly is one, one amongst them. Our center was founded last autumn and aims to improve the public well-being by conducting academically rigorous research, providing world-leading uh, education and contributing societally relevant policy insight on the challenges, but also opportunities of digital transformation. And in line with our mission, our first launch event just two weeks ago with European Commissioner v Vice President Vestager and moderated by my colleague um, Dani Stockmann, dealt with the question of how to regulate the internet in terms of hate speech and fake news. And the second part today, we want to explore and discuss how two major transformation challenges of the 21st century, digitalization and sustainability, are interrelated and how, they, how far they require new governance approaches and especially what kind of governance approaches. Let me now briefly introduce you to Thomas Losse Müller, who will moderate today's session. Thomas is a highly appreciated fellow at the Hertie School, working with our center team from the beginning. He's a public sector advisor and a former permanent secretary and head of the state chancellery in, this, in the German state of Schleswig-Holstein, where he worked on both digital and environmental topics. So there is nobody better to fit for today's um, topic. His work focuses on public sector digital transformation strategies, and he has recently worked with the German Federal Ministry of the Environment in crafting its environmental policy agenda for digitalization. Before I know, now hand over to Thomas, and Thomas, thanks that you're here with us. We've prepared a brief video to give you a very, very little inf uh, further information about the center, its faculty, and its research before we dive into today's discussion. Maite, can I please ask you to start the video? New technologies and digitalization have become the major drivers of societal change. They affect nearly all aspects of our personal life, but also have very broad policy implications in nearly all policy domains. European policymakers are currently making crucial decisions about the power distribution between government, corporations and society in the digital sphere. The changes that digitalization comes with require academia, politics, leaders across the board to revisit some of the most basic fundamental questions of how government, state and society are organized. So what we study at the Center for Digital Governance is how can we bring all these efforts to the future? How can we recognize the challenges that have come up and how can we address them? But also, how can we flourish better? We have more opportunities now, we all have more power, and that's something that we should be excited about. We stimulate public discourse on digital transformation. We provide nonpartisan evidence on the challenges, but also benefits of digital transformation to achieve public good. We study how bureaucracies deal with digital transformation. We also look into how governments can adopt new technologies to improve policymaking. We study the nature of intelligence, both natural and artificial, and we work on the spread of hate speech and disinformation online over social media. And finally, we also look at how open data enables new forms of public services. 
We at the Center for Digital Governance understand digital governance as the interplay, the set of decision-making processes of rules, regulations, structures, which all together drive and shape digital transformation. And this is clearly beyond government. Government is a key actor, but it needs the interplay of government with non-governmental actors. It's so important right now because the world is changing so fast. You need academics to help us understand how it is the society is changing. And what we're really talking about is trying to benefit everybody. Governance is about how do we coordinate for ourselves and then how do we collect the different selves together. Which is why we want to create a space at the Center for Digital Governance to challenge each other, to bring in the experiences and perspectives of the different disciplines to answer these important questions for the future of governance. Things change so fast, you need more and more research. You need to be able to monitor that. It's not just about the past anymore. It's so much about the future. Great. Welcome. Thank you, Gerhard, for this introduction. Thanks, Maite, for sharing um, the introduction to the center. These are incredibly exciting and interesting times that we live in. Um, and I think it's... Um, just um, very timely and uh, excellent that we have the chance to launch the center now. Um, this conversation, this panel discussion and the discussion with um, all of you here uh, in this event is the second uh, as part of this launch series. Um, uh, given that the last one has already been so interesting, this is promising to be very interesting. I'm sure it's not going to be the last one as well. Today, we want to look at um, two of the major mega trends in governance and in policy issues that are meeting uh, at that time, which is on the one hand, um, sustainability and all the complex questions around how we are managing to live within the boundaries of our planet, and on the other hand, digitalization. And there are some crucial and um, also complex strategic and governance questions that interlink here. Um, on the one hand, I think we all feel this big promise of digitalization and technology to help us um, achieve sustainability, to rework the way the things we do, to um, reorganize processes, to um, probably also come to some form of new social interactions that will help us to be more sustainable. On the other hand, um, there's also pretty clear evidence that digitalization in itself does not necessarily lead to more sustainability, but it has its own quite significant ecological footprint um, and could set, up, set off um, uh, dynamics that will lead us from a sustainability path. So the question is, how do we bring these two together? What governance do we need? What are the policies that need to be in place to discuss this? And here to help us understand, understand all of these issues is a, a really great panel. Um, and I wanna, at the start, introduce the four panelists that will discuss these issues with us. Um, and I would ask you to raise your hand so everybody can see a picture to the name. And I'll start with Joanna Bryson. Joanna, hi. Nice to have you here. Joanna is a professor of ethics and technology here at the Hertie School, um, and her research focuses on the impact of technology on human cooperation, uh, on AI, ICT governance. Um, she's been around quite a bit um, from 2002 to 2019. She was at the computer science faculty of University of Bath. She's been affiliated with the Department of Psychology at Harvard University. Um, she's been uh, in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Oxford, the School of Social, Social Sciences, and the University of Mannheim and the Princeton Center for Information Technology and Policy. And Joanna, thanks for joining us. Thanks. And with us is also Elias Jakovides. Uh, he is, hi Elias. Uh, as you can see from his background, he is in Brussels. He is an advisor with the European Commission, DG Connect. Uh, where he's actually coordinating this interrelated work on green digital transformation. Um, and he is um, you're looking at all the EU-wide measures to improve the energy and material efficiency of ICT, uh, but also is working on 
maximizing the positive contribution that digital technologies can have in terms of bringing us on towards more sustainability. Then we have with us uh, Lena Sophie Müller. Hi, Lena. Thanks for being with us. Uh, Lena is already since 2014 the managing director of the nonprofit organization D21 in Germany, um, which is Germany's largest digital network of um, politicians, business leaders, um, producing lots and lots of very impactful um, research and driving the conversation in Germany. Um, and she's pretty much on any commission that you would want to be on if you want to discuss these issues. Um, she's a member of the German Enquete Commission, Artif Artificial Intelligence. She's a member of the Digital Council of the Federal Ministry of Defense, uh, as well as the Digital Council of the um, uh, German uh, Labor Association, BDA, and an advisory board of the as part of the advisory board, Young Digital Economy with the Federal Minister of the Economy. Welcome, Lena. Great to have you with us. And um, the fourth person in this great panel is Stefan Ramesol. He's the co-head. Hi, Stefan. Hello. Hi. Stefan is uh, the co-head of the research unit Digital Transformation uh, within the Circular Economy Department at the Wuppertal Institute, uh, one of the leading think tanks on sustainability issues in Germany. Um, and his focus research and, and of, of this research is on all of these challenges in terms of industrial transformation, cir circular economy. Um, and we've been working together in advising the federal government on its new digital policy. So hi, Stefan, welcome. Hello. I want to start this conversation with the same question to uh, each one of you, which is if we look at this from a big picture, strategic perspective, is digitalization a curse or a blessing for sustainable development? And maybe, Stefan, you could kick us off. Thanks, Thomas. So I think the nexus between the sustainability transformation and the digital transformation has been the major blind spot for the last years, but is the most critical arena for policymaking for the years to come. I think we are entering the most uh, decisive decade maybe of human mankind, because these are the last 10 years where we can decide whether we keep this planet uh, like we know it. And the digital transformation is the most powerful force driving uh, transformation in the 21st century. So this is definitely a potential, a potential which we need to use and put to, into service of this sustainable transformation. However, important to note, this is not about technology, it's not about AI, blockchain and all the other buzzwords. This is about the impact of digital, digitalization on our behavior, changing processes, creating new markets, changing organization. Here is the real transformation power of digital solutions, which we need to leverage and to steer and to redirect, because in many, many cases, this transformation goes into amplification, acceleration, perpetuation of non-sustainable path dependencies and trajectories. So I think course or blessing, it's the question of steering. We have to change course and really understand this as a twin transition. And this is the major policy implication. Understand the twin transition in the sense of not pushing micro-targeting data-based over-consumption, but real choice for consumers to select sustainable products, not only focusing on self-driving cars, but enforcing mobility shifts, mobility transitions by digital solutions, and so on and so on. So the, tr the twin transition and changing the framework for applying digital solutions, that's the key, and here's the change. Otherwise, it will remain a curse. Thank you. Elias. A curse or a blessing? So good evening to everybody. I think that Hertie School is about shaping leadership. And if the leaders of tomorrow are shaped in your hands in Hertie School and in the center, they will not accept this question. This question is kind of going down one level that doesn't doesn't really fit for leaders. I mean, leaders have a North Star and they will take the digital and put a purpose on it. So the digital with the purpose, the green jacketed digital with a purpose, I will explain that later what that means, is what you, it's the only solution forward. There is 
asymmetry between those tra transitions. And that's what I want to make very clear. Digitalization can happen and will happen without sustainability transition. Sustainability transition cannot happen without digital transition. And that is the asymmetry. And that's why the leaders of tomorrow know that this is in a way blessing if you need to answer this question, but it's a powerful tool that has to be tamed. And I, I explained there is a blind spot on taming and that's the material inefficiency of the digital world and digital world that also promotes quantity driven profits that really puts strain on our natural resource. So it's not the energy efficiency or energy consumption that normally people and journalists take. So people, most of the people are fascinated by the and the electricity consumption, but that's not at all the problem with digital. Digital has to create new types of business models, sustainable business models where we get away from quantity driven profits to more of user needs, addressing perfectly user needs with less material and taking care of our natural resource, taking care of our planet. Thank you, Leo. So despite it being not quite the question I should have asked, still we continue. Lena, curse or blessing? Um, uh, good evening, first of all. I'm very happy to join for the second lounge event. event. Um, well, it is a matter of perspective if it's um, a curse or a blessing. If I look at my personal view and look at it from a societal point of view, of course, right now, digitalization is a big blessing. I mean, look at us being in COVID-19 and we all can still have conferences, we can meet each other, and that's all possible because of digitalization. And that comes with the trend of dematerialization. So a lot of services and all that become software and become streaming. And from our studies, we also know that people pick up these uh, new trends. They like to, you know, stream their music um, and on Spotify or use Netflix and all that. Um, so that is, um, as from an individual point of view, of course, there are a lot of opportunities. But also from an economic point of view and from a research point of view, you know, there is a lot of things that are now possible that we were not able to do without um, digitalization. Think about renewable energies. Think about how we can now produce artificial food and maybe be able to feed the whole world in the future where we have a shortage right now. Um, but of course, that also comes with the downside, um, and Elias mentioned it um, already. All these new trends also put pressure on sustainability because um, it uses resources and it, it makes it hard to create a sustainable world. So um, it, today there are a lot of things where it's a blessing, but we need to take actions now to not have it become a course. Thank you. And Joanna, blessing or curse? Well, I have a, a way different perspective um, and not as a, so much as a computer scientist as, as a biologist. So uh, sustainable means to me, you know, really here in the very long term. Um, and so we, we, uh, it's an engineering challenge whether we can keep all this digital technology and make it sustainable, make it truly cyclic. I, I, it drives me crazy when people talk about uh, sustainable and they just mean slightly more sustainable, but actually still going to collapse very soon. <laughs> right? so, uh, so I think right now it is the means by which we can coordinate our action. And so in the near term, it seems absolutely essential, first of all, that we get on top of that coordination because, because we, we've all seen a lot of entropy. If we can't get better at doing democracy in the digital area and uh, figuring out how to uh, come to good consensuses and things like that, and I do think there's hope. I'm not one of these uh, nihilists about this, um, but I think it, the most urgent thing is digital governance in terms of coordination um, between, between nations and within nations, and then we have to handle a problem, you know, like with COVID, we have to say, look, we have to totally radically change how we live, at least in the near term. Maybe there will be technological solutions. And keeping people on board with that process, I mean, we're seeing a microcosm of it now. It's, it's going to be very serious. I strongly believe we can do it. But, um, but uh, yeah, at the same time, I'm not a total expert on the, what's happening with the rare earths. You know, maybe the digital isn't going to be with us forever. Maybe it's, trans, maybe it's transitional. 
But I think what we need to do now, it is the context we're in now, and we need to solve the problems as best we can and come to better understanding. Thank you. Let me actually follow up in this introductory round um, to um, maybe highlight these, these two strands that we're dis discussing here. So on the one hand, um, and in some of the discussions we've had um, uh, in, in Germany, uh, we the, the, the term came up, this is God's last gift. So if we don't use digitalization as the last gift to turn the corner, um, then it's our own fault and we will not be able to make this anymore. So I think all of us are clear about uh, its potential. Um, but Elias, um, you already kind of highlighted the complexity about in, in terms of judging what diff, how, how we steer it, uh, steer it and what kind of green framework we need to put, a, to put around it. Can you talk a little bit about um, uh, material efficiency and energy and where you see the priorities right now? I think you're still... So looking from it from the European level, we, the new commission has two pillars and two executive vice presidents. So just look at the structure and it, it's telling that we have the green executive vice president Timmermans and the digital. Uh, so those two are the pillars of the new commission to the way forward. In the beginning, just, just last summer, uh, we thought that those two are our leaders thought that those two were quite independent. I mean, they were living like on a different planet, each of them. So we have, uh, it slowly became uh, clear that there is such a synergy and such an interaction that is needed that we have built it slow, a step at a time. So when the green deal was published, that was December last year, there was not yet a strong presence of digital. There were some narratives, but not really any target with the deadline and really hard target. So with Commissioner Breton, we actually did it in February and March this year, where we published the digital strategy, the data strategy, and the circular economy action plan, putting very concrete, uh, very concrete targets. And those targets go mostly on greening the ICT because we said, okay, we as DigiConnect, we have to be the adults in the room in, in this uh, conversation on Green Deal. We have to first make sure that we will take this beast that has a dark side that very few people know actually the, the size of the footprint of ICT. Although it's uh, disputed with the different papers between let's say two and 4% of uh, total greenhouse gases, that's the footprint of ICT. So it's not yet 20% or it doesn't compare to some big, uh, big sectors, but it's growing. And if we don't tame it from the beginning, it will get just worse. But there is a way to do it, and there is a way to do it on two strands. That's the energy consumption, and that's where people think of data centers and telecoms and next 5G, and the material consumption. On the energy consumption, what is good is that everybody's incentive is aligned. Public and private incentives is the same. Let's diminish the energy consumption because it's electricity bill of the private sector that wants they want to cut down. So we have complete understanding and a complete alignment. So I see the, the light of the tunnel. There will be some efficiencies in computing. So we're working on low energy processors. There'll be efficiencies in telecoms, call it AI in the 5G base stations, call it uh, fiber call it uh, different software and different techniques to reduce the energy for even more streaming and more data circulation. And there'll be edge computing so that there'll be less telecommunication needed and there'll be some more local processing. And Joanna, I'm sure, is looking into the efficiencies of uh, the post deep learning of AI because the AI itself is really dirty if you think about deep deep uh, deep learning algorithms. So. Uh, there is a way to do that from the energy point of view, where we have a clash between businesses and public, uh, let's say, goals is in the materials. The ICT sector still is based on selling more, gaining more. So more materials, more profit, and that we need to change. So what we have promised to do is on the side of data centers to make them all climate neutral in Europe by 2030, to make the telecoms as much as possible climate neutral, but mostly transparent. So quickly what we will do, we will measure the footprint and give consumers 
the picture? What does they what do they do when they use their mobile and do high definition streaming? So we give transparency to consumers that want to follow some of their choices. If they are really green consumers, they will know how to use better their telecom services. On the circularity, we have promised that we will try and we will put, if needed, actually legislative uh, measures to make the new generation uh, or even the, the existing generation more durable, more reparable, more reusable and more recyclable. So the devices, and that's where the problem is because 85% of the emission is to build iPhone. 15% is to use it during the average lifetime. We in Europe change iPhones every two years. I mean, iPhones, tab uh, smartphones. Uh, so the anything that is, imagine it that way, anything that is smaller than a server, that means desktop, laptop, tablets, iPhones, IoT devices, there is more emissions to build it than to use it over a certain time, as we said. Now, how do we do that? We need to really go down to eco design. We need to make sure that there we fight uh, built-in obsolescence. We enable software updates. We enable reuse, repurpose, refurbish, because recycling is really the beginning of the bad thing. So we need to keep it as long in life as possible before it even hits recycling. And that's that's the big uh, thing that we need to do because that's where most of the emissions and most of the pollution uh, co goes. E-waste is the fastest growing waste category in Europe, in, in the world. In Europe, we are the worst. I mean, Northern mm -hmm. Europe is like 22 kilos per e-waste per person, which is incredibly high compared to the rest of the world. So there is a lo lot we have to do. So that's what we have committed as a commission. At the same time, we're working with all the services on the other DGs because that's what they from they want from us more to enable their sustainability. So we work with DG Agri on precision farming. We work with DG Energy. We work with uh, DG uh, Transport, uh, Manufacturing. For me, there is a silver bullet called let's make digital as enabler of circular economy. If we can achieve that, that's 56% of this of the industrial emissions that we can really cut down. This is the powerful tool. I personally work on something called product passport, where we can trace and track materials, products, components. So in a way, I, I look at myself as the mercator of the economy. If I do the cartography of the economy and I know where the resource is going, I can try to make the circularity happen better. With the, of course, with the help of the B2B uh, profitable services. So the motto for me is unless we make sustainability profitable business, a green deal has no chance to succeed. So it has to be profitable. It has to be new sustainable business models that we enable through digital and digital is the way to get the data, to get the new understanding of how to do. I'll just give you one example and I, and I stop there. It's not about digitizing all these sectors. It's not about digitizing agriculture. Imagine the digitalization of agriculture would mean that farmers have to buy GPS for their tractor, drone above their field, uh, IoT sensor in the in the soil. They have no money, they have no experience, they have no skills for that. What we really would need to do is to take companies that produce agricultural products like pesticides and fertilizers and make them digital. Either they partner with the digital companies or they become themselves digital company and provide service to uh, to farmers and the service is a health a crop health protection i mean the crop protection and they can get fee let's say 10 euro per hectare just a fictional number and they will provide service saying i will take care of your plants i will decide where i put pesticides and fertilizers and guess what because there are services they will minimize the use of agricultural products so now it's a cost to me so i'll spray the pesticides only if needed and where needed. So as a result, you have a business model where I have guaranteed as a service company income. Farmer has the guaranteed expense because every year he has to spray more and he has to put more fertilizers. Soil is healthy. Our food is healthy. That's what I call win-win through digital. So digital itself suddenly disappears in the equations. Mm -hmm. What we need to do, we need to look at this North Star of new way of doing business and think of any economy any any sector of economy that kind of switch can happen instead of selling bulbs sell light instead of selling cars sell mobility so that's just to put you on 
kind of that's what I said. Don't think of IT. IT is my tool for my North Star and I have to give it a purpose and I have to tame it. And the taming is what I said before. Thank you. Yeah, and, and let me you know put this back to to the three of you, um, Joanna, Lena, and Stefan. I mean, so Elias is now pointing. So we I think we can agree there is a, a baseline, a precondition that we make ICT as green as possible, looking at material efficiency and energy. But the really interesting question is how do we get there? So we have the North Star and we are talking about transformation and transformational goals, <clears throat> but at the same time. <clears throat> I think we can't assume that this will just happen by itself, that that just because there is digital technologies, that they will pay into this this goal. So Stefan, you already um, uh, wanted to start, but you know, also invite Lena and Joanna to um, uh, to come in. You are still, <laughs> Stefan, you, you still need to. Always the same. So thanks, Elias, for putting the resource efficiency on the table as we have been working for decades to make it <laughs> A topic on the agenda and the circular economy is definitely one of the major challenges and I think this leads exactly to an interesting question to ask what is really the transitional power of the digitization of digital solution it's not about efficiency making things just better it's about making things different so it's not the industry 4.0 having better factories it's a circular economy 4.0 which organizes the metabolism in a cyclic way depending on data, depending on transparency, enabling to observe the full value chain to the uh, raw material sources and uh, have educated decisions. However, I would love to go even a bit further asking where can digital really make a difference? And let's put your agriculture example. This is already a step into the right direction. However, we are still in a production mode and having incentives uh, towards overproduction. If you're looking at the discussion around the common agricultural policy, the question is how to achieve a paradigm shift in incentivizing farmers for preserving ecosystem, for bringing ecoservices, nature preservation into the scheme. So this is the transformational aspect of agricultural policy. And here, digital, for the first time ever, makes it possible to monitor these services and to have a practical implementation of this paradigm shift. So that's the one thing. Look where digital makes a difference. And the second thing is, in order to understand the transformational powers, the question, where is digital different? And this leads me to the urban space when it comes to reorganizing urban traffic and having a modal split and interplay of all the different mobility services. This is definitely something which is enabled by digital. But what about urban planning if Google is the only one what's knowing what's going on in the city? So here we have a different sphere where the question is, what is the nature of data? What is the definition of public goods? What are goods of public interest? How to include people into that? What is the role of commercial private players? What is the role of the public government of institutions to organize, for example, road as a public space? And here, I think we are in the middle of the governance debate to organize a transition with the help of digital solutions by understanding the paradigm shifts induced by digital. So where does digital make a difference? Why is digital different? I think this is something which you have to put on the table, put into the equation. Lena, Joanna. So, uh, yeah, the... Um... So I, I'm sorry, I thought I was the third again, so <laughs> that's okay. The the jumping in, the 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 thing I wanted to comment on immediately was actually uh, this agriculture thing. So so while I don't want to disagree with your guys' uh, vivid uh, visions, I you know ultimately we shouldn't be talking about going back to the raw sources if we're talking about materials like metals. We should be talking about a truly cyclic uh, uh, economy is about cycling all waste back into being the raw material itself. Joanna, I think we just lost you. Joanna. Yeah, lost. Okay. Now it's, no, you're, I'm, you're do back. you have me? Yeah, I, okay, I, I never lost you guys, so I don't know what happened. <laughs> anyway, there's a, there's a certain amount of, uh, of uh, self-healing that the ecosystem does. I mean, definitely life keeps getting richer and more productive. 
But ultimately, we really have to be thinking, you know, and all waste is e-waste. So this isn't something we can break into sectors because like the cars are definitely e-waste and we definitely want to be building fewer of those. Even tearing down buildings, concrete is a huge problem, right? So everything is about both figuring out uh, technologies to compensate and the sensing thing, I totally agree. Uh, you know, so helping people to recognize when they're causing problems or if not people, uh, villages, societies, but there's massive needs of change in terms of the how the economy works that isn't about getting us to keep updating with new materials. We just, that we got to slow that down now. Um, and finally, there's a word of warning that agricultural uh, vision that was brought there, it's something that has been happening in North America. And uh, again, because of the digital component, um, it, it is going into monopolies. And so unfortunately, one of the issues you have is maybe you're giving the farmer back more stuff for their land if they still own it, but they no longer have unique knowledge about that land. Now John Deere and Monsanto have unique knowledge about that land. So again, we really, really have to solve. I think the first problem to solve is <clears throat> democracy. It is about power sharing and um, personal well-being, freedom of thought. Those problems are, are uh, core. And then we need to move as quickly on uh, sustainability as we've moved on the pandemic. Um, let me let me add just two um, point of view from Germany, maybe. And, one is, um, I think there's a big difference in how European um, policies are created and how German national policies are created. And I do think that European policies are, we, are a, a lot more have measurable goals um, that you say, you know, like, for example, till 2025, you want to reach a certain um, a certain rate of CO2 or keep it at a certain rate. Um, if we look at digitalization um, and sustainability, um, the German government, I think, does not have enough measurable goals. Um, there's the digital summit coming up, for example, on November 30th and December 1st, uh, where all uh, ministries uh, from Germany come together with the chancellor and come together with corporate to discuss sustainability. Um, but I am pretty sure that we will not and the summit with actual uh, actually having me measurable goals. So um, maybe um, Herdy School will, you know, go in and be like, we need we need more uh, governance governance uh, governance goals. Um, and the second thing is um, that I do think we need to address society more because they do play a very crucial role in all that. So if you have business models that actually um, try to you to buy a new iPhone uh, every two years, um, then of course you're gonna you gonna have to have or you want the innovation, you want the the newest model, you know, you want the new Face ID and whatever the new model um, brings to you. Um, so I think one way to get society to support your policies is to explain a lot more what the carbon digital footprint is. Um, because for an individual, it's not really measurable. You don't see CO2. Um, you know, you see, of course, if uh, if your streets are dirty and all that, but you don't really see how uh, you create e-waste. E so I do think we need more uh, action in terms of that. Thank you. So I think this was great also in terms of illustrating the different levels of policy interventions that we're talking about from reducing the ecological footprint towards um, facilitating innovation in terms of just having technologies that are less carbon intensive, for example, that have a lesser ecological footprint. But then we already kind of now enter the transformation question. So digital as a possibility to do things in completely different ways um, have business models that encourage and provide incentives for um, more sustainable behavior, more sustainable business practices. But these are actually questions of governance because transformation as a whole doesn't just happen because somebody has a good idea. You need to organize this, which is um, where I would like to take the opportunity to introduce 
um, the other faculty members of the Center of Digital Governance, because that's their job to solve. Um, and we have with us uh, <coughs> Gerhard Hammerschmidt, who you've already met, uh, Danny Stockmann, um, who is part of the, the, the center. Um, uh, we have Keegan McBride, who is a postdoc uh, with the center, uh, Turit Hostet, um, uh, who is another faculty member. And I'm not sure whether Luciana is joining us today. She is on, um, on parental leave. So all of these um, uh, great minds at Hertie School look at these issues. And in opening it up to Q&A, and you're welcome to um, raise your hand or put your question into the chat. We'll monitor it uh, in the audience if you have a question. But I think Gerhard has already switched on his camera, so he might want to ask the first question. Thanks a lot. Just as a small icebreaker question before the others can come in. Uh, a typical question our students somehow would come up, and it's a, it's a question to Stefan. I mean, you're working a lot with German government, German environmental ministry. I mean, my question would, what, what do you regard as the key policy impl implications from a more managerial perspective? So what do we need to do? What, what should government do? I think that would be what all our students would like to hear. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, that's a great question. And uh, the interesting thing is that managerial relates to the uh, Latin origin of manus, hand. You have to put... Sorry, you, you're muted, Sorry. you're muted. I think you're muted or you... That's fine, I think now it's better. So thanks for the question. Um, the reference to managerial roots into the Latin manus, hand. So what I wanted to say is managerial means putting the hands on something, shape it. And I think uh, what we have touched a bit, and uh, Elias was very explicit on this, we need guidelines. And these are guidelines are different. We have different layers, be it uh, efficiency standards for electronic devices, uh, be it uh, guidelines for requirements for repair, the right to repair, or be it simply the transparency uh, where different of us refer to. And I think uh, Lena Sophie mentioned this, to make decisions, be it on the consumer side or be it in the corporate, uh, demands transparency. So I think that's something where we have to organize simply the knowledge, the data to navigate. So Elias or Mercator providing <laughs> the, uh, the, the landscape, a digital product passport is providing a tool to navigate because I know wh what I'm doing. And the second thing is related to that information, we the consequences in terms of prices. And this is a very old statement from the sustainability scene. Prices have to tell the ecologic truth. And some of the business models, by replacing a smartphone every two years, having 10 orders in the e-shopping and sending 12 back, relates to that prices do not reflect the true costs. And putting the two things together, right pricing, costing in the end, and information allows to develop proper business models because then we have new sweet spots, new opportunity spaces for entrepreneurs, for businesses, and at the same time, new incentives for uh, consumers and the recipients of these services. And this is, in the end, a pure governance and a public task to define these two informational and uh, monetary uh, guardrails. Great. Thank you. So let's look at some of the questions. Mark already um, posted a couple of minutes ago the question that it would be interesting to know to what extent the large hardware providers have agreed to align themselves with those commission's goals and might might actually have pledges towards it. And <clears throat> Alan is commenting um, that raw materials used in most of the tech industry, um, that there is an OECD guidance intended to cultivate transparent min mineral supply chains uh, and sustainable corporate engagement in the mineral sector, for instance. Elias, this is you know, kind of yes. co coming back to some of the, the things you said and would also give you an opportunity to react to some of the other things that have been said. Okay. So on the question per se, it's uh, if you do it eco design, we make it a legal obligation. So there will be no way out. But what what the question actually is talking about is the materials and the ethical and the society, so social issues behind the mining and the material um, circulation. I mean, the way uh, it's extracted and used. And I think what we need to do there, uh, I, they have pledges and I already work with the major companies. So I, I try, I will try to create some kind of a coalition of the ICTs from SMEs to the giants 
and I already talked to most of them and they they made the pledge. They understand they want to be on board, but it's the business models that I talked about. Huh? And they do also have their own uh, non financial reporting and the disclosures. They all agree that uh, we have to do jointly a calculator and evidence creation of the impact of digital, you know, the net impact. So the positive minus negative that we that is credible and it's credible by the public authorities. It's credible by the procurers. So that's about the governance. I, I agree with Joanna that more than anything, it's a governance. I, here I take the opportunity to tell you that very soon, next month, hopefully by December, you will see our regulation on data governance. And that will be basically what John is calling for. We want to create conditions where the data, because it's at the end all about data, uh, is governed properly. OK, so this is I agree very much on that. And uh, the other issue I wanted to discuss, I mean, what Stefan was saying is that the natural resources are not valued, and that's the biggest problem in the pricing. The financial resources are overvalued. Human resources are somehow valued. Natural resources are not valued at all. And unless that changes, we will have to really get into it. Now, the uh, materials for companies is bigger expense than the labor cost now. So they start understanding that this market failure of reused material, the secondary materials availability, uh, affordability and kind of reliance is not there. So it's much cheaper for me to import something like lithium from Peru that is treated, by the way, in China, which is completely bizarre before it comes to Europe. It's co completely irrational because that's efficient and we need to get, uh, go away from efficiency because that was efficient way to doing it to more resilience and more natural way of doing things okay and i couldn't agree more i mean i have a couple more things that i wanted to say as a reaction to stefan first that it can help efficiency and that's what mostly the sectors themselves when they have it in their hands so if you talk to transport minister or energy minister he will take the it to do n plus one innovation when you give the it to a it specialist he will disrupt it completely. The sectors themselves don't have normally that dis disruptive element in them. So if you gave IT to a minister of transport, he would not come, he would never think of Uber. Do you understand? If you yeah. give it to a minister of uh, urban planning, he would never think of Airbnb. So this kind of disruptions come from different directions and that's the IT's power. So yes, IT is always and I was always there to do my efficiency gains, healthcare, you know, urban planning, smart cities. But it's the disruptive element that we need today because the North Star is unprecedented challenge. I mean, there was never in time in humanity that we faced such a challenge. Think that the Heritage School students that are listening to us, guys, this is your opportunity 100 years from now to be remembered as the heroes that turned it around. And IT is a perfect tool. It's one of the many tools, but we can, I mean, this new generation can stay in the history of mankind as the people that basically turned it around. So this is about your students, about the leadership that you can really inject in them. Thank you, Elias. Lena Sophie, you had a reaction as well. Yeah, um, I was wondering, um, there's an idea from Maya Grupal, or at least I read it from her first, um, and she, she was thinking about how can you um, set an incentive to um, make corporates act different. So right now she said, you know, we tax the workforce. And she said, what if in the future we tax uh, the use of resources, uh, the use of energy, and that would give an incentive to corporates to, you know, produce more energy efficient and with with less resources and they would probably come up with pretty innovative ideas to do so so i was wondering you know in the in the round uh, joanna and and all of all of you uh, what your thoughts on that are like you can let me also um, maybe kind of collect a couple of questions now because um uh, we don't have that much time anymore. So Daniela, Dani, you were raising your hand for quite a while already. Thanks. 
Uh, hi, everyone. I'm also a professor uh, of the Center for Digital Governance, and I was part of Launch One. And at Launch One, we also we discuss challenges for democracy. Um, and in our discussion, also business models, similarly to our discussion right now, also have come up as a cause for problems such as misinformation, uh, but also problems related to political advertising during elections and so forth. So I'm I'm curious, um, what in in when in this discussion about sustainability, what alternative business models towards the most dominant targeted advertising business model that pr promotes overconsumption uh, is is being discussed in in this discourse about sustainability? Thank you, Dani. And in the chat, we have um, Luca pointing out that. We've seen this big moves in how global players are interacting. So after um, the European Commission uh, set out its goal on climate transformation, uh, China and Japan followed. Is there something like this for ICT production? Mm -hmm. We've also had this with GDPR. So is this the way that we can think about it? And then Keegan asks, how do we ensure digital sustainability is also done in an equitable way? Is to say that earlier starters um, which have um, you know, first mover advantage, but also first mover costs are not disadvantaged or on the other hand could not um, then um, uh, take take winners, exit all markets and dominate them. So mm -hmm. I think those are the questions that I have right now. So please, um, yeah, Joanna, you're yeah. first. Okay, so yeah, I'm not muted. Okay, good. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I uh, coming in, uh, for uh, Donnie's question and uh, Keegan's in particular, but but I think uh, on general, mm -hmm. the, when we're thinking about how to keep society together, I mean, when we really are thinking about inventing new business models that are not driven towards massive consumption, we need to think, well, what is it for in the first place? And I think fundamentally, the economy is sort of a representation of security. It's how people are glued together. It's how we decide, you know, it's, it's how we are defend our capacity to exchange goods between each other and to, and to keep our families alive, to perpetuate our societies. Um, and I think we have to really think very radically about, so then why does it have to be commerce-based? Why does it have to be, I mean, product-based, does it have to be product-based? Um, I think and, and when, you, when you talk about motivation through prices, then uh, this is where that ties into Keegan. You know, yes, I think that's important. These are good ideas, but are they good enough? The the thing about equitability is that then you have, uh, especially in a digital world where you can have single providers who win, then all of a sudden they can spend, you know, uh, half a billion uh, uh, pounds uh, buying a company that <clears throat> of, of 13 people or whatever, because because they are they have so much money to burn. And so the these uh, the environmental perspectives, if you if you price something to make them behave well. Then you're going to just price, you know, the entire countries of Africa out of the market, and so I, th I think we really need to be thinking about redistribution, because uh, we know that polit the political polarization is correlated with inequality. We know that social uh, uh, mobility is inversely correlated with uh, inequality, right? So, so to get people to trust each other again and to work together, we really need to. How do we get? large corporations uh, and, the, and the extremely wealthy to be redistributing better, you know, they still have their lead, they go ahead and have an advantage, be, be the most famous and proud people in the world, but not this kind of lead, not this kind of thing that makes people feel like they're on a different planet and they can play dice with the rest of the people. Mm -hmm. I would like to add to this because in the end, I think both questions again from Dani and uh, Keegan touch upon uh, about the question, where is the source of economic power? Where's the source of competitiveness, increased competitiveness and then leading to dominance? And I think uh, this is something where we have to have a closer look and a better understanding of the source of dominance in the digital age, which is strongly related to data and the ability to generate and an analyze these data and to make it an inclusive, exclusive resource. And I think that's something where old, uh, again, governance, principles, traditions, experience does not hold any longer. So the question is uh, how to govern these sources, how to regulate competition, how to regulate uh, power, be it 
on a geopolitical level or within companies, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we have to think about data. And that's maybe even an answer to your uh, question, Lena Sophie. Uh, how does the uh, sustain, uh, sustainability scene debate the issue? There's now an increasing debate on taxing on data. Why shouldn't dominant corporates pay with data by sharing data, giving data to others, by equalizing a bit the difference, the bias? by having more public data, data of public interest, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's something where we need a different approach to a phenomenon which is not the same as the dominance of companies in the 19th century where Standard Oil was a cartel by having access to physical resources. This is now a different way, re uh, requesting different uh, approaches. So can I dip in yeah, there very quickly? Please. Um, yeah, artificial intelligence is not just about data. It is also about physical resources. And just I just don't don't forget, Google has something that Europe doesn't have. They fabricate their own chips, which is one of the reasons they have cybersecurity. So uh, let let us not forget that 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 I I actually think that the that the inequality we're seeing driven now is sort of similar to what we saw in the 19th century, uh, and late 18th century. Uh, sorry, yeah, late 19th century. Because we have new technologies that reduce the cost of distance, and so we have smaller numbers of winners, and we haven't figured out how to govern that. And the same thing happened before, only with, with different people. So I actually think this is uh, continuous with the kinds of problems we've seen historically. The problem says, but maybe not the answers. Sorry, Elias. Just wanted to say that the inequality is my biggest worry. I know the inequality just within the digital sector over the last, I'm watching it over the last 20 years that the digital itself struggles with, uh, you know, the digital gap and all that stuff. Now, the cocktail of the digital and green can create inequalities that the gilet jaune in France is nothing compared to. Yeah. Because you can go very fast and introduce measures. Like I, I hear from some of the mayors saying, next year I will forbid uh, cars in my center and only I let only electric cars to go in. I mean, and then you think about it and say, well, what does it mean? I mean, who can afford electric car to get in? So. You see suddenly, you know, uh, then they shake their hands and say, OK, OK. But this this uh, strife and this urgency of the green can actually go into decisions that are not so equitable or, or, or sustainable. So I agree very much with Joanna that we really need to pay the attention what nature always did. Circular circularity of economy or circularity is ancient. I mean, it's from the beginning of the Earth. Earth mm -hmm. does it all the time. This is a natural way of doing things. And we need to come back and learn from that again, because we need to completely rethink our economy. So there is market failure of secondary materials, I said. We need to rethink that. And we need to mm. rethink what producer's ownership means. Because if I'm a producer and I will own it and I, it will come back to me, I better avoid certain types of inks because I'll never get it out of that material. It'll be too expensive mm. for me. So I will redesign completely everything because I own it and I will have to reuse it. I'll have to get the material back. So that will completely change the incentives in a way. Mm. Now on the Germans and German scene, I work with the BMU for more than a let's say, year and a half. They are, I mean, to me, they, uh, I don't know what you guys say in Germany, but they, they to me, they take a leading role. They, they're very good in understanding what is happening, the BMU. And on the 17th of December, you will see what they will prescribe to themselves and to all the other countries. So there will be council conclusions with actual specific targets. And those targets, of course, are targets that we already did uh, on the EU level, but they also want to go beyond. So the understanding and the targets that uh, Germany will try to lead the Europe on this one is quite strong and it's quite welcome. I have a question. Please go. Cool. Just a quick question to Lena Sophie, because uh, we're talking a lot about uh, politics uh, and the need to to steer the digital development to the right direction. There was, at least in the past, the tendency to perceive any attempt like this as a roadblock to innovation. So leave digital alone because uh, we don't want to stop innovation. The digital technologies have to develop freely in order to keep pace with innovation. Uh, being deeply rooted in the scene, how's your perception? 
is uh, steering or guiding uh, the digital transformation into a, rec uh, into a certain sustainable direction a roadblock to innovation? Is this contradictory to innovation? I think it's uh, sometimes it's still perceived as a roadblock. Um, I do s see, especially with international big companies like you know Microsoft and 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 those um, that they try to take a leading role a role in um, taking responsibility and setting goals. Um, but if you ask me about the whole digital scene. I would say the topic is being discussed, but there are not enough actions taken yet. So yes, I do think it's more seen as a roadblock than uh, as a chance um, to actually make better digital services. Joanna. I, I, I have to unfortunately agree. First of all, the question reminds me of uh, hearing Billy Bragg talking about the idea that home taping was killing music, as if music was something that could be killed. You know, mm -hmm. of course, we'll be innovative. If you take, if you challenge us more, we'll innovate harder. <laughs> you know, but 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 uh, unfortunately, I, I I do agree that we still have not succeeded in communicating to big tech the fact that regulatory innovation allows everybody to do better, that they can flourish better, their customers can flourish better. Um, but I, I think honestly, big tech is a natural ally of uh, liberal democracy. They, they, in order to do well, they need there to be millions, preferably billions of people with a little bit of money in their pocket. That's how they. That's how they, their business comes from. You know, a decent education and some food. Uh, and so they should be allies with us. And yet they still don't see that we're 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 working to create a public good. And yes, it'll cost them something. But but that they can, like I said, they can still be the biggest, the most famous, the ones on television all the time, the ones with the most advertisements. It's just that they that we have to create a situation where they can keep that and have it more stable, actually, and, and perpetuate. Thank you, guys. There's been um, a couple of comments in the chat. Um, also a question again around the risks of monopolization. Um, and I want to take that as a just a, just a takeoff point for maybe the last round of comments because we already um, over the agreed time. Um, but I think the last half hour demonstrated that why this becomes a governance question um, because we need mm -hmm. to deal with <clears throat> the complexity of transformation, uh, looking at equality issues, looking at um, uh, reorganizing. Uh, putting the right incentives, maybe even the state having a stronger role in providing infrastructures uh, and guiding lines and, and managing a complex transformation. Um, so with that, to each of you, the question, what, you know, how do you look at governance? What, you know, what kind of leadership would you look for? Um, what kind of questions would be the first question that you would put to the center of governance in terms of um, advancing this agenda? And um, whoever kind of raises their head first, which was um, Elias has the first answer, please make it a short one so that everybody can have a final statement. Elias, yeah, please. No, it's okay, I can wait. Uh, I don't need to be first this time, it's okay. No, but now you are first, then we can- Oh, now I am, okay. <laughs> So uh, on the monopolization, I just wanted to, and I, uh, I'm thinking of the telecom sector. Telecom sector was monopolized. Now it's uh, competitive, so we have broken that. And it's the hardest uh, competitive, I mean, it's really competitive sector. The profit margins are very low and the competition is very tough. So if somebody thinks, yeah, in the light sector, somebody could monopolize if we kind of follow the services and if we regulate properly the markets, I think that could be okay. Uh, there was a question about data. Data costs, I mean, every email, every email with the attachment, it's four gram of CO2. So what actually, what I wanted to say is that is the elephant in the room. And I worked on several, I, I worked many years in healthcare and aging and demography shifts and all that. There is, and there are uh, one common denominator in all the societal challenges, call it security, health, uh, uh, greening, and that is the individual behavior. I mean, the holy grail of everybody who works on societal challenge 
points to one, can I change the behavior of individuals, you know, as consumers, as patients, as, uh, you know, security uh, guardians. And that's very difficult because we are very irrational, luckily, otherwise you'll be very easily manipulated. So it's good, but it's really hard to nudge. And I've seen and I worked decades in healthcare to nudge patients. Why do you kill yourself with alcohol and, and tobaccos and sugars? I mean, it's hard to change people's. What is easier in the green space, it's because it's about our children. We do more about our children than we do about ourselves. So there is a little bit more incentive on that one, but it's still the inequality and the fairness is harder. Why me and not him? And why does he can do that? And why? So the, the fairness is really difficult, the just part on this one. And that's why the governance and really thoughtful steps that need to be taken and big giant leaps have to be taken. That's why kind of quantum innovation from ICT has to happen. And I don't believe because that's always what I hear from ICT. Don't bother me, don't bother me. Otherwise, you will not have an iPhone 14. They don't realize and now talking to tech, they do actually. So the leaders already are on another path where the challenge will make them to innovate even harder. So they see the possibilities for innovation just if they put a purpose. That's why I come back to what I said at the beginning. Let's put a purpose to this innovation and you will see that it will accelerate the innovation. And that's basically my uh, closing statement. There was a question, I think, about Matsukato and Matsukato is leading our missions. I'm actually in the mission of Clyde adaptation. Matsukato is the inspirer of that. How can we actually, through this innovation, grow our economy, the green growth? I mean, that the, what I call kind of sustainable prosperity. I don't want to talk growth and, and GDP. This is so passe and so bad as a paradigm. So uh, let's call it sustainable prosperity. And, and the way we don't really need to grow, we just need to be secure, as Joanna described, and just to live in a prosperous way. Thank you, Elias. Lina? Uh, let me quickly uh, let me quickly open the door. I'll be back and then let's let somebody else go first. Sorry. Okay. Stefan, then I'll, I'll I'll ask Joanna last. So <laughs> Stefan. Okay, this time sound on. So I think the, the major challenge, and as you said, the, what is the topic? The topic is to organize a prosperous life of society and economy in a limited and increasingly more limited physical world. That's the point. And this is a radical uh, change as we don't have much time to adapt to this pl uh, planetary boundaries. And this organization leads directly to the question which was touched by uh, Joanna several times, to organize public goods. Be it the atmosphere, be it equality, be it public space, uh, you name it, as there is not enough space for each and every one. So we have to organize public goods welfare within boundaries. And this is a governance question in the interplay between public and private bodies. And of course, any individual has a role, has a play in this, but maybe different to Elias, I'm strictly against by certain attempts to put all the responsibility to the consumer saying, make simply better choices and the, well, uh, the world will flourish. This does not work for many psychological reasons. So sticking to the alcohol is a great example. And as well, because they're overcharged, they cannot deliver that performance. And therefore, I think we have to have a communication that is creating the confidence and support of the individual for a governance of frameworks, which limit then the individual space for movement. I think that's the challenge, which is a difficult one, because always you have to have these communication routes to regain support for limitations. We have to organize limitations within the next decade. That's the challenge. Thank you. Lena. Um, I would agree that it is hard to nudge uh, society to do something voluntarily. Um, so it is a responsibility for governance and for governments to um, explain, you know, why we do it. So, you know, start with the why. Um, great book, by the way. Yeah. Um, and I also, since it's uh, the, the last uh, the last uh, discussion round, I do think that we really need an institution like the Her uh, Herdy School 
um, to also bring this international discussion to the uh, German politics and to, to the German discussion, because I just realized this in this round is we are not that far in the big digital di discussion in Germany. Um, we have not really included all these thoughts on sustainability. We do talk about it, but I think we have to think deeper. And I think Heritage School will be a, a very great value to do that. Thank you. Joanna. Yeah, so I realized I get to go last because I am the professor at Herdy School in the Center of Digital Governance. So I should indeed thank all of you for uh, contributing uh, into into our uh, second our second uh, launch. I don't know how many times we get to launch, but I loved the idea that there might be. A <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I I do want to uh, come back though to the question, which is that. Um, I think there, I, I really liked uh, the directions that some of the other uh, answers were going. I'm, I will again push it a little a little further. Um, if we really are trying to reimagine our society, uh, one of the things people have been afraid of is like you know AI taking all the jobs, and that's not what we've seen. We've seen that uh, where we bring in digital technology, we we make people more productive, and often that actually makes them more valuable to employ. And so I think the really interesting question is what can we do to um, you know, make sure that everything that needs to be done to keep a lot of people together living near each other. So that includes, you know, garbage men and things like that, you know, not all, you know, all massively desirable jobs. But at the same time, uh, can we can we nudge or push or model or something towards the, those basic human goals to compete? can we express those in things that are sustainable instead of ways that aren't? So rather than, than wanting, you know, uh, uh, I don't have this year's model of, of phone, but I still do have an iPhone, right? Uh, the, the, um, so ra rather than competing on the basis of devices that, that are very expensive, can we start uh, competing again on handiwork or something, you know, decorating your house rather than making your house bigger? You know that these can we find ways to be engaged with our society, engaged with our neighbors, um, and 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 that doesn't sound very digital, uh, but but the digital is only a tool. People are the point, and that's why it's about digital governance, right? It's about both how we can use the digital to better govern ourselves and how we can govern what the digital is doing to our society. We're we're trying to do both. Thank you, Dana Sophie. Joanna, Elias, Stefan, everybody on this call. Um, we had a big audience. Thank you all very, very much on behalf of the Center for Digital Governance. This actually was a beautiful discussion. Um, and I think we now know what to do. Um, it's not a small feat um, and not a small effort, um, but that's why we are together and in this together. So thanks everybody. Thanks for staying with us. Thanks, thanks for a great conversation. And see you back, hopefully, at the third launch event. Um, and let's make this a series. <laughs> Thank you, Gerhard, my team for organizing. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you, Thomas. It was a great Thank discussion. Thank you, Thomas, for yeah. putting yeah. us together. It was a pleasure. Bye. 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 If it was so easy. <laughs>